Good morning, Clear Branch. I am grateful for you, those of you who are with us this morning. I know that we've got folks who are away on vacation who may be taking the day off. For those of you that are here, I'm grateful, truly. Um, it's always a blessing to be here in this place with you. It's always a blessing to worship with you, um, a blessing to preach, to bring a message to you, a, a, a blessing to be able to celebrate communion and to recognize and remember baptisms and to, to experience what it means to be the life of the body of Christ. And this morning we have a lot to celebrate. We have so many things going on in the life of the church over the summer from VBS and trips with our students to uh, hosting annual conference here at the end of June, the 27th to the 29th, to all these different things that kind of embody the nature of who we are at Clear Branch and become kind of part and parcel with who we are within not only this community, but within the greater Methodist community, the global Methodist community in North Alabama. So. Lots of things for us to plug in and do. And sometimes I think we become really, really focused on being people that do and don't really succeed very much at people that can be, right? You understand the difference. We're, we're all about the doing sometimes. I think we forget about the being sometimes. I think we forget about the being present together, being here in this place, being responsive to what it is that God is pouring out upon us and calling us to and desiring of us in faithfulness. If you were with us last week, you know, it was Senior Sunday, and I preached a message about uh, kind of challenging our students and challenging the body relative to understanding these points of origin for us. And, and during this series called Generations, we're going to continue to kind of focus on those places of contact and connection that are so necessary in our lives. As we get started this morning, I'm curious, how many people in this room have a mentor? I do. It's good. That's wonderful. You know, I actually happen to have a couple. One of them is in this room, Joel Dobbs. Joel and I meet you know, once a month and we talk and we plan and we think and we interact and it's been wonderful. Vaughn was a mentor of mine. I feel like I've got a group of men that come up and that surround me on Sunday mornings and play with me, Ron and Russ and Brian and others, Mike Mueller who's not here this morning, but lots of folks that, that wind up being a prevalent part of my life and my experience. People that will hold me accountable, people that will challenge me, people that will encourage me, people that will pray for me. In many of those instances, those people are a little bit older than I am. I heard a chuckle, a little bit older, it's okay. Sometimes maybe they're a little bit more than a little bit older and that's okay too. You see, what I would argue is that when we surround ourselves with people that have greater life experience than we do, we have the unique opportunity to not only learn from their example, but also to be blessed by the time that they spend with us. To be blessed by what it is that they pour into our lives, to be blessed by the words that they share, to be blessed by the accountability that they hold us to. And I would argue that that's something that many times is missing from so many lives is having those people that will be that mentor for you. We find in scripture again and again, examples of people that call and live out lives of mentorship, of teaching and of challenging. And today we're gonna spend time focusing on that. Specifically within the context of the book of Deuteronomy, I know if you're a, an Old Testament fan, uh, some folks kind of get thrown off by the Old Testament, but, but the Old Testament is wonderful. Deuteronomy is a book that was written by Moses. It brings lots of information. He gives us the Deuteronomic law. We have the Deuteronomic covenant. We're gonna talk some about that today. And in those places, it's important for us to remember that while Moses is teaching and leading the people of Israel, he's also training up Joshua who will take people into the promised land. And so there are people who can help to lead us to that promised land as well. And in those folks, as we are thankful to our great God, we should be thankful to the blessing that he provides us and the people who walk with us along that journey. So this morning, as we dive into scripture, will you guys join me in standing for the reading of God's holy and precious word. We're coming from Deuteronomy 32. And we're looking at verses one through six. Give ear, O heaven, and I will speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. 
For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and a twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You guys be seated. I'm sure there are people here today that heard this and they think, man, that is not a lot about mentorship. I promise it gets there, right? These early verses are a reminder as Moses calls out and attempts to hold accountable the people of Israel who have kind of lost the plot. It's almost as though they've taken God's word, they've set it aside, they've decided to choose their own way instead, and the results have been, well, let's just say disastrous. And it's a cycle that we find throughout Scripture. When God's people are close to God, things go well for them. They are blessed. They experience abundance. They, they have this connection and relationship with God, and they inevitably have this tendency to kind of fall out of practice. They, things are going well, and they think they don't need God anymore, and they depend on themselves, and they kind of have this fall off, and they ultimately wind up in this, this valley of despair and brokenness. They recognize that they have lost connection with the God who made them and the God who calls them and the God who leads them. And so Moses is reminding the people as they are nearing the promised land not to fall into these habits of being ungrateful, but instead to understand that God, the rock, as he is called in verse four, is perfect and just and faithful and upright. And that he calls them to be the same way in order to help set the stage for you guys this morning to to get a sense of what's happening if you're not familiar with the book of Deuteronomy this is the third major section of the book and it it comprises a section that runs from from chapter 29 to to chapter 32 and and this this idea of covenant and connection is is a prominent theme within the midst of of this section of Deuteronomy. And you say, well, what was the covenant, Jeremy? Well, this was a covenant that was a little different than what we find previously. If you're familiar with Old Testament covenants, you know we've got the Mosaic covenant, we've got the Davidic covenant, and what we're talking about today is the Deuteronomic covenant. And so many of these covenants are focused on kind of this communal respect of who God is and who God calls us to be. And though that's important for us to respond as a body to who it is that God is, to go and to do and to be the body that he's created us to be. There's also this need for a necessity requirement for us to recognize that it's also something that's very personal. And so when Moses begins to teach in this way and he begins to call out the people in these chapters, he's doing it because he desires for them to understand that it's not only something they're intended to participate in as a nation, as a people, but something they are intended to participate in as individuals, recognizing God's creative work and presence and blessing within their lives. In other words, he's telling them, yes, it's important to be the body. But it's also important for you to recognize that you play a unique and specific part. Subsequently, there is this relationship and connection. He's calling them to understand the importance, not only of their lives, but of every life that has come prior to them and every life that will follow them. And sometimes I think we could use that reminder as well. Understanding the importance, yes, of creation. Understanding the the presence of covenant. Understanding the importance of what God calls us to. And realizing that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob should also be the God of Jeremy and of Mel and of Debbie and of Greg. 
You see, one of the things that was beautiful and we find again and again in the Old Testament is that they continually proclaim God's goodness and God's grace. In those moments where they fall short, they're reminded, wait a second, we have got to remember and have faith and respond, be grateful for what it is that God has done. And in a very real sense, that's what Moses is reminding them of in this moment, calling them from twistedness, from wickedness, and instead into recognizing the power and the presence and the might of our great God. You see, Moses is leading the Israelites, and he's been doing it for a long time, from Egypt to the Promised Land. They've gone through all of this distance and all of this time. They've experienced God's leading repeatedly through columns of smoke and of fire. They've eaten of manna. They've consumed water that sprang from rocks. It was an adventure, to say the least. But this experience has given Moses insight. He knew the nature of the people. He knew that they needed to learn from their pasts and strive diligently not to repeat the failures and the foibles of those who had preceded them. Now, how would you imagine that he might challenge them to do that? Well, if you've read ahead, if perhaps you've looked on to the verses that follow, you may recognize that he does that through calling out faithfulness and connection to learning from the generations that have come before, to asking their fathers and the elders with the hope and the expectation that they will teach them and guide them. You see, earlier this morning, I asked how many of you have a mentor, and I think that we've lost sight of the significance that comes in these relationships with people who have lived life longer than we are, or longer than we have. I remember being a, a high school graduate and thinking that I had everything in the world figured out. Maybe you can relate to that. I was convinced that I was going to go to university and I was going to be this amazing student and that I was going to eventually come out and I was going to do something also equally amazing with no idea what it would have been at that moment. Maybe law school, I don't know. Maybe I'd be a teacher. I thought I had everything in the world nailed down, that it was in the palm of my hand. And what I found very, very quickly, much like the image you see on social media, the meme is like our idea of how we get from point A to point B is a straight line. And then we look at how God gets us from point A to point B. And it's like peaks and valleys and corners. And sometimes we fall off the mountain, have to climb back up. There's all these different things that happen to us. And that has been my experience. That as much as I may plan and think go so far as to even say believe that these things will happen in the way that I think they will what I find again and again is that most times the way that I believe things will happen is absolutely positively wrong and yet in the midst of every situation every peak and valley and turn and misstep in the midst of all of it God is present and God is active and God is calling me back faithfully, recognizing his plan and his purpose for my life and desiring for me to not lose hope in spite of things going differently than I might have originally imagined. If you had told 18, 19-year-old Jeremy that he was gonna wind up in a pulpit in Birmingham, Alabama at 45, he probably would have laughed at you and said, there is no way in the world. And yet here we are. And there is no place that I would rather be. But I've gotten to this place through the blessing not only of God, but through the blessing of God providing people that could provide insight and accountability and encouragement along the path. And that's exactly what Moses is doing, not merely for Joshua, but for the entirety of the people of Israel. He's telling them, yes, you've made mistakes. And you know how you can avoid those things? Ask the people who came before you. And they'll help to point you in the right direction. We really see the culmination of that happen in verse 7. And ultimately, it's this call for them to engage with elders and fathers to learn. Hear, hear God's word. It says, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. 
So who is it that you call when you need insight and help? Who is it that you call when you need direction? Anybody? Who's that? Dad? Yeah, absolutely. If your father's still alive, absolutely. Tremendous resource. Who else? Friends? Yeah. Grandparents sometimes. There are lots of people in our lives that we can call out to. What I would argue is that so many times we neglect to do that. If you know anything about the generations that have come before you, my experience has always been that they're willing to share if you're willing to ask. And the problem is that so frequently we're unwilling to ask. We have the mindset that because we know better than they did or because we have more technology or more available information or, I don't know, terabytes worth of computers in our pockets that somehow we have the ability to outthink or outknow. It simply isn't the case. As it was for the people of Israel, those who are older than us and wiser than us have the unique ability and oftentimes a tremendous desire to teach us See, Moses knew his time was short. And he began to encourage them to look to older, to other people who were elders so that they could gain insight and understanding so that they could learn from the mistakes of the past in an effort not to repeat them in the present. And there are countless things that we can learn from those who come before us about relationships, about life, about business, about choices, about raising children, about canning vegetables. It could be any number of things that you can learn about. And it truly, merely takes asking. I'm curious within this room, if you're over 65, would you be willing to share your knowledge and experience with those who are younger than you? How about just a raise of hands? If you are younger than 65, look around this room. There are a great number of people whose hands are raised because they have information that they are willing to share with you. But it requires interaction and connection. As Moses puts it, it requires asking, which means we must be willing to ask. We must be willing to acknowledge that we do not have all the answer, to remember that there are experiences in lives that um, sometimes go well beyond the things that we can learn from Google <laughs> or from YouTube. And so we must begin to have these interactions and relationships with those who are older, recognizing the blessing that they are and receiving the information that they can share with us so that we may share it with those who come after us. You see, over the course of these verses, Moses is proclaiming God's might and his faithfulness and he's, he's contrasting that with the failures of the people of God. He acknowledges that sometimes we are an irritant, <laughs> that sometimes we are negligent, that sometimes we lose the course, that sometimes we are unresponsive. And yet, every day provides us with an opportunity to seek out those relationships, to learn and to be changed, improved, by the very relationship with those who have come before us and the appreciation for the lives that they've lived. You see, Moses challenges the people of Israel to this because he does not want them to fall into the same routine, to neglect to understand the benefit of that which has already been learned and experienced. If you had to kind of encapsulate it, I would argue that Moses in this moment is challenging people to understand the importance of learning and sharing. You'll hear this in verses 44 to 47. Moses came and recited all the words of the song and the hearing of the people. 
he and Joshua, the son of Nun. And when Moses had finished speaking all these words to all of Israel, he said to them, take to heart all the words by which I'm warning you today, that you may commend them to the following generations. That we would hear these things, taking them to heart. He warns them in verses 46 and 47. Take to heart all the words by which I'm warning you today that you may commend them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law, for it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word you shall live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. See, here we have this challenge of recognizing that not only are the words important that are shared with us audibly, the things that are spoken to us, remember these words came before these, these things were written. The Bible did not exist at this point. This was all verbally transferred from generation to generation. There was an inherent connection that existed within the people of Israel between the older and the younger. And yet Moses calls them not to write these things down in books yet, but instead to have them written upon their hearts. That they would not be empty words, but that they would be words that would shape and challenge and encourage. That in the process of breaking these cycles, these cycles of brokenness and of sinfulness that have permeated the generations that have come before them, that they have to take God's word to heart. And if you're familiar with the scripture, you know that there's over a hundred verses that are related to us not merely possessing knowledge of God's word, but having our hearts transformed by it, where it's written upon us, not merely in knowledge, but in assimilation and practice. Perhaps you guys have heard that before, the idea of the 18 inches that exist from the brain to the heart. You, know, you can have knowledge of something, but does it really change you and become formational for you? The people of Israel were familiar with what it meant to know these things, but they were pretty poorly capable of actually living them out and being changed by them. And it is my hope that in this place that we would develop a relationship with those around us that would allow us not only to appreciate God's word, but also God's word within the context of our lives. To understand what God has done in the lives of people in this room in such powerful and transformative ways would go a long way to helping us to appreciate what it is that God has done and is doing in our lives. And I think about how many blessings are present in this place. I think about how many folks have seen God's hand at work in their lives who have suffered and battled against sickness and brokenness, who have overcome their own shortcomings and stumbles, who have become totally and utterly wrapped up in recognizing of God's goodness and grace. And I can't help but think that those are the things that we need to share first to be willing to proclaim no matter what age we are that God is good and then help people to understand how we have experienced that goodness. See, one of the things that happens in the midst of Moses' writing is that he constantly reminds people to not only remember it, but to proclaim the might of God to remember and proclaim his blessings and to do it without hesitancy, to do it with passion and excitement because God is faithful and God is working. This is something that we can put into action as well. To be willing to share where it is we have seen God work not merely today, but throughout the course of our lives. 
and to be willing to bring others into that experience through the sharing of our lives with each other. It's my hope that if you have experienced God's goodness and God's blessing, that you would be unable to shake the desire to share those things with others. If you have experienced things in life that give you a unique perspective and opportunity on God's reality and God's faithfulness, that you would be willing to share those things with others so that they may celebrate what God has done with you. May we be a people that not merely have knowledge of who our God is and what he has done, but to allow his word to be written upon our hearts and to apply it and to teach it and to share it as we put these things into practice this day and always. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for those who have come before us and we thank you for those who come after us. We thank you for your faithfulness and steadfast love. We thank you for your blessing. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to be so aware of the many ways that you've been at work in our lives that we have no choice but to share it with others. Help us to call out to you in times of need, but Father, also to profess you in times of thanksgiving. And to remember, though sometimes we feel we have it all figured out, that our knowledge and our plan always fall short of yours. And for that, we may be thankful. For you are so faithful and so good. We thank you for this community. We thank you for the blessings that we share together. And we thank you for the challenge for us to pour into others as we proclaim your mighty acts in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen.